Who sent him by Molinari Drone and then he moved to Manchester for five years with Larry Muller. Muller, Fuller, 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 Fuller. And then uh, now he's back in, in Rome, Athena, although he, uh, he spent uh, like uh, six months or so uh, in Caltex uh, learning how to make the pipeline for the Kesher Targa Targa. So, uh, so today we will. Hear about the uh, clouds and dynamics uh, clouds from the clouds. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Xavier. Uh, thanks uh, for the hospitality for the nice introduction. So it's a pleasure for me to be around uh, Morelia, also because the week before I was in Boston in MIT and in Boston in Norway, so it's definitely better here in Morelia at least <laughs> from the weather side. So uh, my job as uh, Javier was introduction is uh, was an introduction to me. Uh, it basically based on the study of the galactic dynamics, so let's say from the large scales down to the small scales. So what do we mean for large scales? So just to give you an idea. Now we are talking about galactic physics. So large scales for us are what we call giant molecular clouds. So objects that goes from, let's say, 10 to 100 of parsecs uh, or so. And then from that, you move down into basically the star formation process, passing for what we call galactic filaments. So objects that are basically clouds as well, but a bit more elongated. So the densest part of what we may call giant molecular clouds. And the size is still from one to up the 100 parsecs. Now, if you want to understand the true uh, formation uh, process, the next step is to look at the density regions within these filaments, what we call clouds. Those are over density regions, you will see more later, of the sites of about a parsec or so. Here is where we really form the first protoclusters. In fact, inside the clouds, you can form the first fragments and cores. So the real, uh, let's say, birthplace of your uh, cell forming regions of the sites of about 0.1 parsec or even less. And then we need to put the discs and so on and so forth. Now, this is the picture that we have in terms of structures. And now the question is, how do we transfer the energy and mass from these large scales down to the smaller scales? We are talking about a range of uh, more than several order of magnitude scales and several order of magnitude in densities. So how do we transfer the energy and the gas from the largest scales down to the smallest scales? Now, the, uh, from the theoretical point of view, you can ask to your colleagues here in Morelia. If you want to know a bit more about observations, is what I'm going to do today. So all the talk will be basically based on observations. So let me start with this that I usually put as a touching point of the discussion, and this fits very well here, I guess. So all the discussion started more than 50 years ago uh, for this reason, basically. Not by me. <laughs> So if we count all the masses we have in the gas of in the giant molecular clouds, we get about 10 to the nine solar masses uh, in total mass of gas. Now, if we take the free fall time of these clouds, so how much time it will require for all these gas to collapse and to form starts, you get about 10 to the seven years. You, get, uh, you do very quick calculations, you get about 200 solar masses per year, which should be the accretion rate of our galaxy if the whole galaxy was collapsing due to all the gravity. Now, what we observe in several different kind of observations, you can go from the far infrared, you can go to the uh, ionized gas to look at that, and there are several ways, you always get a value which is around two solar masses per year. So we have a factor of 100 that we are missing somehow. Something had to slow down the collapse due to only the gravitational free fall. What is that? And this is where we're going to be 
uh, goes in. So you have several models already, and there are several theories. So let's say the two kind of uh, families of theories, if you want, is the one that assumes that everything is slowed down by basically the turbulence of the ISM, which plays a role in forming the small structures due to the edges of the structure, of the turbulence itself, and somehow slow down what they collapse. Otherwise, you can imagine, as Enrique knows very well, and not just in here, that you probably have the gravity is actually playing a significant role in pulling down all of the material, in accreting all the material, which is uh, slowed down by basically the, uh, if you want, the complexity of the gravitational motions into your clouds. And then there must be uh, some strong role played also by feedback. So let's take these two kind of families as a, a very simple overview of the picture, and let's see what from observation we can learn. First, uh, let me go uh, quickly to the outline of the talk. Then let's look at uh, the, then, therefore, the interplay, if we want, between turbulence and gravity to see which one is dominating and which scales. And let's do that at the various scales that I presented you before. So we go to the diameter of clouds, filaments, and clouds. And I will show you how to connect those of scales in a way to really look at the multi-scale flow from filaments to clumps. And then if we have time, we also to look at what's happened from clumps to fragments. Mm -hmm. Before that, just a quick introduction of the relation that we're going to use to investigate these dynamics of the various scales. So the so-called Larson and higher relations. So we have three main important relations that are the Larson's one that are very useful, especially observationally, because are relatively simple in a way to get out the numbers of these parameters. And the one is the so-called first Larson relation, which basically means that in case you have a supersonic, uh, if we assume that we have non-thermal motions and that the NSM is given basically this non-thermal motion by supersonic uh, uh, gravity, uh, sorry, turbulence uh, under shots, these motions then should create you a relation that is something like that. Basically, you take your velocity dispersion of your giant molecular clouds or whatever scales of objects you want. You take your radius. If there is a turbulent driven motions, you expect a power law basically that in which the bigger is your clouds, the larger is your velocity dispersion, and the power of this relation should be on the factor of the factor of 0.5 or so. Now you have a second parameter which is extremely important to understand the deformation of clouds, which is the real parameter. Oversimplifying it is basically the ratio between the total kinetic energy of your object and the total gravitational energy of your object. So the total contribution of the two. Depending on the ratio of these two components, you may assume that your cloud is either in a case in which your viral parameter is much less than one, meaning that your gravitational energy is much larger than your kinetic energy. You can imagine that your object is dominated by the gravitational component and therefore it's called very collapsing. Vice versa, you can imagine the opposite, in which your kinetic energy is way much larger than one. And then you can imagine these objects are basically transient. So this, this kinetic motion is dominating, driven probably by turbulence, and then your object will just flow in. When you are in between, you can imagine there is a sort of interplay. Now, we can discuss uh, between uh, one and two. I'll do a bit that later, but uh, let's assume that if you take it one, it means that you are in the so-called Viral equilibrium, so you have another static cloud collapsing, basically near to collapse. And then you can imagine that your clouds may be in this state, because this is what we measured. Now, the delta Larson relation is actually related to these two. So if we assume that we have pure turbulence in our clouds, and they are viralized, now, as a consequence, if you do a very simple math, you get that the ratio between R squared and M must be constant. But this ratio is actually proportional to the surface density of your cloud. So the three lots of relations are related. And I'm telling you that if you look at your clouds, and basically all your clouds in your galaxy are more or less at the same density and are more or less the last, you would expect that they will collapse following the turbulent power law spectrum. So they are turbulent dominated. Now, the point is that the three of them are related. But if one of them is still true, the other two, may not be. So you can assume, for example, that your clouds are more or less viralized, but that you don't have a constant surface density of the clouds, which in fact we don't observe. And if we start observing clouds with different surface densities, but still viralized, the implication is that they cannot have this kind of personal correlation, which implies that if you have clouds at different surface densities, as we have, and they are viralized as they seem to be, they cannot simply have completely turbulent dominated the region. They must have some other components in there. Okay, this is the framework in which we're gonna look. 
because as a consequence, then you can simply write down again the linear parameter, and then from the definition of the linear parameter, you see that you get basically a relation which is something very similar to the first order relation, the first order relation time your surface density. Now, the linear parameter equal to one is our assumption. But if the surface density is not constant, the consequence is that your large relation, which should be itself constant, is not, and becomes a direct proportion to your surface density. Which means that the component that is not driven by turbulence only should relate to your component of the surface density. In the surface density, the gravitational component of your cloud. So your cloud is collapsing because of turbulence or probably because of surface densities depending on how these relations will connect each other in the plots that I'm going to show you now. So let's start from the large scales and let's see how these kind of relations will go through the various scales. Now, the largest one that we can think about are the molecular clouds. Now, remember that we have observers. So molecular clouds for us doesn't mean H2 clouds. We cannot measure H2 at the temperature of the clouds, which is around 10K. What we can do uh, is to look at the first, uh, um, at the largest uh, abundant molecule that has the pole moments, so it emits enough to be bright at the temperature of 10 to 20K, which is the temperature of the clouds, which is the CO. So we look at 12 CO, 1 to 0, which is the lowest density transition of the CO, and then we can get uh, all the boundaries of the, of the most diffuse, let's say, and big molecular clouds in our cloud, in our galaxy. So at 12 CO1 to 0 cloud is what we observe as called a molecular cloud. Then we have conversion factor between CO and H2. I don't want to go into that. Let's assume it works. Anyway, those are the clouds for us. Now, we can build many of uh, these uh, surveys. You can combine them from the north hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And in this way, you can get a full galactic plane surveys done with your uh, telescopes to look at 12 CO clouds. And you get a map like that, which is a famous survey, uh, collection of surveys done by day in 2001. You get here some of the parameters that you expect from these clouds. And now the same kind of data that has been reanalyzed recently by Mark Antoine in the Shans in 2017 paper. And that was to refine the models of them and to look also the, let's say, flux with clouds and to get as much material as possible into the, into the game. He ended up with about 8,000 giant molecular clouds that you can see are already distributed across the whole galactic plane seen face on in this plot. Now, how do they look like in the large zone and, large zone and the higher relation, the one that we were discussing before? So those are the first large zone relations that were built at the beginning uh, from the 80s <laughs> to the first uh, in the ages of 12, 2000s to look at these relations and to understand uh, this kind of behavior. So here is the large zone relation. So uh, radius basically, uh, let's say size of your cloud against velocity dispersion. And you see that in this 12 C1 to 0 clouds, they have a very nice relation with the exponent, which is about 0.5. Since at the time, in this kind of analysis, they have realized that, and they have this, uh, this kind of slope, the three large zone relation related, the surface density would have been constant. And this was the assumption for several years, actually, that the molecular clouds had constant surface densities. What happens if we do the same analysis now in the Mark and Plum plot? So let's say with much more kind of dynamic range into the analysis of the clouds. Now you look at the first large relation, the slope here is the 0.5, and you say, okay, but it seems to kind of fit, but the scattering becomes much huge, much larger. And in fact, if you go now in the higher relation, remember that if the large relation is true, here you would expect a single point, which means that the surface density must be constant if they have realized, so there should be just one point in this plot, not a cloud of points as we see. Which means that these guys at these scales cannot be driven by turbulence only, as predicted by the last sense of relations. And in fact, they span like almost two orders of magnitude, actually, even more probably, in surface densities. So there must be some other mechanisms that is playing with the dynamics of the clouds at these scales. Can be gravity? Could be. We'll see. So let's divide, actually, let's look only at the higher plot now. And I think what is interesting to look is at two different regimes that we can see in these plots. One is for, let's say, relatively low surface density of the clouds. You can see here, if you just cover this part, that you have a kind of plethora of points with your velocity dispersion of a radius that goes quite high and quite dispersed. So here, the kinetic energy, which is, if you want somehow, uh, say, here in the, in the y-axis, is dominating over the orientation of energy. So those guys, those clouds, 
This is a possible interpretation. I guess we discussed a lot with Tavir and Enrique about that. But let's say one possible interpretation, at least my way of interpreting that, is that the kind of low density cloud may mostly be unbound and may simply be transient with the kinetic energy due to the turbulence of the ESM that we know is there, is dominating and probably let, letting them disperse. The situation is different if you go a bit more inside the cloud. If you go actually more than inside your cloud, if you go here on the more density clouds, in this, in this case, you see that there is a kind of better correlation between your gravitational component and your kinetic component. That means that if you have your kinetic energy that correlates with your gravitational component, your kinetic energy could be driven by your gravitational component as well. Meaning that if you have a, glo a global gravitational collapse of your clouds, is this collapse itself that is driving part of your kinetic energy in your system and gives you this kind of better correlation that you see with respect to the low density clouds, in which you may expect the gravity as a sigma. Now, even more interesting, you can see that the cloud of points actually tends to stay not along the real parameter equal to one, but to the real parameter equal to two. Now, this is an idea that I had several years ago, and I think it's pretty well, that is the way in which I interpret it is extremely interesting. Now, here, again, we're not theoreticians, so we are basically getting velocity dispersions and radius of the clouds. Well, if you remember from a few plots before, your cloud can be something very messy. So you define a sort of radius, you take your velocity dispersion, whatever it means. So you're basically taking the ratio between these two energies to define a virial parameter. Not necessarily some theoretical value of the virial balance of your cloud within the physical region that you're measuring. Which means that we are simply correlating these two parameters, which may not necessarily be related to the real virial status of your clouds. It may simply be a ratio between them. And in this way of interpreting, if your kinetic energy is completely driven by your gravitational energy in the way in which we measure it, which means that the kinetic energy that we measure is due to the gravitational content of that cloud, so how we measure it, those two things should be correlated on each other. And actually equal to each other if it's completely equal to each other, which means the real parameter becomes two. If you remember the fish of real parameter is two, the ratio of the two. And that's exactly where this cloud of points seems to lie. Suggesting that the clouds, for the way in which you observe them, the kinetic energy in these clouds is completely or mostly driven by your gravitational component, telling you that the gravity may, may play a significant role. If this scheme is true. As far as we go inside the cloud, which means, if you want, looking at these kind of regions into the clouds, because you have these clouds, you can have clouds here, but as you go inside, you start to increase in your surface density. So you start going inside. If this picture is true, as much as you go inside your clouds, you start to see that the gravity component should be dominating over and over even more, because of course you go in a density regions, small regions. We assume that the gravity is dominating here and here, so it should dominate even further. So if we go inside, we go into the filaments, as I was mentioning before. So kind of similar uh, in terms of length, but much denser and a bit more elongated. And you can get from a parsec or so scale kind of filaments to up to tens of parsec scale filaments in your galaxy. You can have all the different kinds of structures, but those are definitely the denser region that you can look at. Now, just to give you an idea of how the galaxy looks like, this is uh, the Herschel survey made in the far infrared. Now, uh, this is the galactic plane seen from the blue, which is the 70 micro image, to the, let's say, yellow, which is the 250 micro image. And basically, these objects are much denser, so you can start to look at them in the dark. This is the, dust, the cold dust emission between 10 to 40k across all the well, piece of the galactic plane here, in which we can really look at the filamentary structures from the dense parts, so from the dust emission. And you see how complex is our galactic plane. Now, the giant molecular clouds of before are much larger. Inside, we start to have all these kind of filamentary shape. We have denser objects, which are called clumps. I'll talk about that later. But this is just to give you an idea of how complex is the dynamics in our galaxy. And now we indeed expect that there must be some interplay between gravity and turbulence to create all these kind of weird shapes into the galaxy. Now, we can extract single filaments from these maps and then look at that and see if this ratio between kinetic and gravitational energy is playing some role in there. Now, this work has been done uh, now a few years ago by James Kisano. It's a bit of uh, extended work to, uh, to extract from the high images all the various filaments or candidate filaments, so let's say elongated regions in the dust. And then you get a distribution across the galaxy that looks like that. 
you are here, and you get objects compared to the J available clouds with similar properties but higher in densities at the end, and you get about more than 30,000 filaments across the whole galaxy. This are the that's covered the whole galaxy plane, and the far infrared again is the way to look at, this, at, the, at the peak of the mission in these star forming regions. Now, the physical properties of these filaments, so mass and radius, which are the things that we really count on, can be get from the infrared and some mini surveys, so the galactic plane that I showed you before. The gas kinematics now comes from CO. But we need to do another game now. We are going inside the clouds. So before we were using a 12 CO 1 to 0. Now, this tracer becomes optically thick as you go denser and denser in your clouds. So you cannot use it anymore. It becomes optically thick, something like that. You cannot get a velocity dispersion, which basically is a Gaussian fit of your sphere, oversimplifying it. You need to go with higher density traces. This is an example of how a 12 CO1 to 0 map will look like in 13 CO2 to 1 map, for example. And then sometimes you have to go even denser than that, as you can see in this example, to look at the core of the formation inside. So you start to look at kinematics in these kind of regions. And now with this new CO tracer, you can go really into your uh, onion layers in kind of objects, if you want to imagine that in an oversimplified way. Now we have the, the dust emission from the physical properties from Herschel. We have the kinematics from CO. We can build our last annihilation. First, let me just tell you that this kind of games is such important that there were several surveys dedicated to survey the galactic plane in CO at different transitions. So this is just to give you an idea or snapshot of how many surveys have been dedicated to look at CO transitions, a different transition, exactly to look inside the clouds at various density ranges, let's say. Now, what happens if we take, for example, the Sedigism survey? So the one that combined the 13 CO2 to 1, combined also with other surveys. So CO3 to 2, 13 CO3 to 2, and you can see the literature actually here are the 12 CO1 to 0 data that I showed you before. Now, in principle, we would have expected a mixture of data in the Arthur relation, but a pretty nice higher relation. Ah, that's exactly not the case. It's actually a bit more confused than what we have seen before. Why? Uh, okay, and, uh, I don't have the answer actually. I have some kind of hypothesis. But you can again see some behaviors. So here, the scatter is quite huge. And here again, you see two kinds of different behavior. What's happening at low surface densities, in which you would expect uh, even before that the turbulence was somehow dominating the system. So even inside your clouds, because this contains basically all the clouds, also the ones that were unbound in the, proper, in the previous plots. So not necessarily the ones that have the nice correlation with uh, surface density and kinetic energy. So you may imagine that even without, within your cloud, you may have regions that are still unbound. And as you go along higher and higher density regions as well, you start again to see the gravity contribute. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> each point is one cloud. Yes. So, how many are there? Second? How many are there? Uh, these are, if you remember uh, from setting, there are about 6,000. So, in total, about 10,000 in the total. So. Probably a related question. So, does it make sense to make these plots? for objects only in a more narrow range of sizes? Because uh, I wonder if that contributes to the scatter because uh, in, in the plot of, of the, the sort of plot of, of the right, you're putting together, say, different uh, environment, you know, region. there are very dense uh, uh, protocluster clumps, no? That yes. would, would be at, in the plot on the right, 10, at 10 to the two, 10 to the three, no? Yes. And you can have a low mass, small star forming core that would be at the same sigma on that plot, but it's a very different kind of object, no? So, I completely so, agree with you. Uh -huh. And so, I'll give you the full answer in 10 minutes. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I completely agree with you and I'll show you how you go inside to not just taking care of the sites, but most importantly, taking care of how you should look when you look at these correlations, if you want to build them properly, because here, and this is what is been done in literature, because it's the best thing that you want to do if you want to do statistics, you take clouds in plots here, you look at all of them, you put them all together in a plot, right? But then you're looking at clouds of different sizes, different evolutionary stages, different positions in the galaxy. <laughs> but if you want to build a plot, this, to me, is what's giving you this crazy scatter of these different components. And then we'll change a bit the picture if you start to connect points, as I'll show you later. 
And that's what is somehow summarized in crucial role of the environments, which means exactly you have to look at single clouds in a way. But if you put just two points here, it's not that easy then to interpret the uh, upper like that. But we'll see how we can get out of it. Now, as a next step following this way of truth before going to the answer, is to look now inside the filaments. So again, the picture seems to be clear on large scales. It becomes much more complex once the environment starts to play a role. What's happening now is we go inside the filaments and we really look at the clamp scales. So, so the particle scales over densities where we really think is the subformation of the ring. First, how do we form these clamps at the connection between several filaments? Now, again, since it's not clear the picture, you may have a kind of local collapse. So you can have your filaments, but somehow locally you start to have some kind of gravity that at the parsec scale is kind of working to produce your, uh, your cloud. Otherwise, you may have some converging flow of filaments that on, even on larger scales is really flowing your mass and energy into the cloud. So it's a much global view of the collapse. And then actually there are even theories that say that uh, from the H1, so before you form your giant molecular clouds, you inherit uh, basically the information from the collapse flow in the H1 uh, to form the final clamp stage. But this is not easy uh, demonstrable by observations and not yet demonstrated. But just to let you know that how we do form these over densities is not clear at all. But we do see that. So we do see that, and we can catalog them, and it's actually quite important to understand how they work. So those guys now change complete their properties. You go about, uh, let's say, about around the one part scale in terms of radius. The temperature is more or less the same with the filament. You are treating still cold, uh, you are looking at the cold dust envelope of protostar or even uh, starless or pre-stellar formation. The mass goes much less than your filaments, of course, but the density is increasing quite a lot. Now, you are really looking at the densities more or less circular or elliptical within your uh, filamentary structures. Now, with Tiger, we can do the same again that we did with filaments, so we can extract all of them across the galaxy and we can uh, categorize them. So this is just to give you an idea of how many parameters we can have, but don't go into these details. I just want to show you here the distribution. We are at the center here. You see more than uh, 150,000 uh, clumps across the whole galaxy, probably even uh, about 100,000, so but then uh, there are 50,000 uh, certain and with not clear distances. But for this, we know relatively well the position in the galaxy, the distance, and therefore the mass and the radius. So everything that we need, to build the last relation, we see in the velocity dispersion. So we should use another CO tracer now to go much deeper inside because at this point the density is much higher. There is no CO tracer able to look inside these objects in particular. Okay, I'm telling you that later. Let me first see, say these things, which is quite important actually. Now, the next step that we can do compared to filament and, uh, and uh, clouds is that we can also classify these clouds in the evolutionary phases. We couldn't say much in terms of evolution from filaments to clouds because those are big regions that involve uh, several phases of subformation at different time scales within each of them. But each single clump can be actually quite easily identified uh, different evolutionary phases. One way to do that is to look at the distribution of a parameter which is called L over N. So it's basically the total luminosity of your clump over the total mass of your clump. Now, the total luminosity is basically the, the integrated uh, luminosity of your spectral energy distribution in the mid to far infrared. Now, the youngest objects, when the protostar is not yet really switched on the linear protostar enough to warm up your dust emission in the far infrared, they will look like this guy here. If you look at the 70 micron object, they still look dark, dark and dense. So those are dense and very cold objects that are probably still have some star formation inside, but super deeply embedded, not enough to switch on your protostar at the point to warm up your dust envelope that can be seen at 70 micro. Instead, when you have a protostar like that, you start to switch on your protostar at the level that it can warm up your dust envelope and they become apparent at 70 micro. When you integrate all the luminosity of these objects, of course, the higher they are evolved, the higher is their luminosity. You take the luminosity of a mass, which is a distance independent parameter, and then you get a distribution something like that. The lower level of L over M is seen for the 70 micron quiet objects, and as you go away and you start to evolve with evolution up to the H2 regions, your L over M increases quite a lot. Now, we can do the same game of before then building the various relations, but we can also look at the different distribution for evolution to see if they evolve with time. What I was mentioning before, 
it was that we cannot use simply the CO uh, because the CO is optically detectable everywhere. We need a much higher density tracer. In this case, uh, we use the DN2H class 120. Now, this is a molecule that is associated with dense and cool gas, but it's very, uh, the abundance is much lower than the CO, so you can really get it only inside your class. There were a few at this point also, the surface will not cover the galactic plane, but they have to pinpoint the clumps that you want to look at because you need to integrate it for quite a lot of time. And so there were several surveys dedicated to them. A few of them have done also with the RM30 meter, which is a single dish to look at specific objects. But the largest one has been done by the Malta 90 guys that looks at roughly 200,000 clumps in the galaxy. Then we can combine this data with the FIGAL data. And this is what I did in 2018, which was to basically look at the last and higher relations, combining at the time, but even now with the NTH plus, the largest data set that we had in terms of dust continuum, so information on master radius from IVA, and velocity dispersion, so information on 90 to get the velocity dispersion of these clumps. Then you take all these clumps that you have, you combine the samples, you play with them in order to be conservative, but to be sure that you get a final sample that is reliable, you end up with about 200 clumps that you can also separate for different evolutionary phases, for what I was mentioning before. And this is just to give you an idea of how these clumps look like. They are distributed in this part of the galaxy, and this is the LRM distribution, and those are the various numbers of those clumps in the various evolutionary phases. Now we can build our half Larson and I relation. And finally, the I relation is exactly what I was expecting, a very nice line across half a year equal one, more or less. So, that's a relation is telling something very interesting. There is no correlation in this problem at all. So, it's flat, uh, very scattered and flat. So, if the lots of relations should be something like this, might be. So, you have an excess of kinetic energy that is flattened your relation. Now, the first interpretation, the easy one to me would be okay, at these scales, must be right, dominated. So I derive the lots of relation because I must have an excess of kinetic energy driven only by gravity, which means that this guy should be completely uh, related in the higher relation in a very nice line. And they are not there as well. And this is true for all evolutionary phases. So the picture must be a bit more complex than that. So this is telling us that kinetic energy cannot be driven by turbulence only. This not very nice correlation to say the least, is telling us that if gravity is dominating, that disentangling it from the observations, when you take a sample of clumps here and there in the galaxy, is probably not enough to really get an information about that. So how can we understand if there is a, some rule of the environment that gives you this kind of scatter, or is this interface really driven by gravity at these scales, which is to go back to the answer of that. So to close this part, let's summarize what we learned. Giant molecular clouds, so this seems to learn something that it seems a bit more confusing as you go into filaments and completely crazy if you go into clumps. The only thing that you can get out from the clumps case, if you put this, this is about here, is that you definitely have an excess of kinetic energy at the clumps case that cannot be due to the turbulent cascade all. Otherwise, in some way, you should follow the Larson relation because it is the relation expecting turbulence all. So we know here there must be some contribution of gravity, but it's very difficult to disentangle how and why. And it's not clear what happens on larger scales. So, of course, there are several questions that can be raised at this point. What I will try to answer in the next few minutes, and also to answer to the question that we before, is if this interplay depends on different density of the transforming regions, for example, or if the environment is playing a crucial role here or not. Now, the next step now is not simply to take all clouds of, clouds of filaments like separate entities. But let's try to look at the different scales and combine them together. This is the key point, because if you have a two-point cascade, you want to look at this cascade to, and to avoid the impact of the environment, of the regions, particularly in whatever kind of feedback you may be. So you have to take your cloud, you have to take the cloud into your clouds, and then follow the cascade inside of these objects. That's the way in which you should look at the cascade. And this is what I tried to do in 2012. So I took the filaments, and now I take the clumps inside of those filaments to look at the cascade into those filaments. Now, the environment is the same, of course, and you're looking really at where the cascade should be. And let's see what we learn. But first, let's do something even smarter in a way. So, taking only the objects that are 
setting are compiled. So you try to avoid that as much as possible protocellular outflows and feedback from the inner uh, sources inside, trying to get the kinematics as, as much as possible, as possible, as say, to refer to the time column. And let's also divide them in three different, uh, let's say, regions of surface densities. Let's focus on the two extremes, because with the uncertainties in the parameters, it's not clear the minimum. But the two extremes are pretty clear. The ones that are above 0.1 numbers in the square, in which are the threshold that we assume to be the one that should justify the formation of mass objects. And let's take the one that are below 0.25 numbers in the square. So concept should be somehow uh, quieter of forming low mass stars. So we can get, again, the kinematics of the clamps from the wedge class, the kinematics of the filaments from the 13 co one to 0 in this case. And let's now combine the two. What happens? Now let's look only at the large simulation of filaments. You take all your, oh, sorry, of clumps. You take all your clumps, you put in your large simulation, and you can see that basically there is no relation as well. If you remove this point, basically this is flat or over distributed. But again, all those clumps are here and there in the galaxy. So it's the same as before with just less points. If we do the same game for the filaments only, you get basically the same answer. A huge scatter and basically points distributed here and there. What happens though, if now we combine the points, as I was telling you before? It happens something way more interesting. Now, those are the same kind of points you see here, but now each clamp is directly connected to this own filament, with, uh, to the filament in which it belongs. And now the picture is way different. Because first you can notice that apart one or two of layers, the slope seems to be more or less similar in the two extreme cases. And way more importantly, if you take the average slopes, you see, again, in the extreme cases, that the slope here resembles a bit the last relation. Actually, it's even deeper. It's even steeper, which means that probably you have even lose already some of the kinetic energy due to the turbulent cascade. But if you go to the higher maximum, the situation is slightly different. The slope is actually much, much is less deeper than the last one, at least. Meaning that some of the kinetic energy here must be arise from something different than only turbulent kinetic energy. Why? And we will discuss about that. I cannot exclude that the turbulent kinetic energy is dominating these guys as well in the, let's say, relatively low mass filaments to clumps. But here, for sure, some other mechanism has to go into the game. Uh, and the level, the difference here is only the surface density of the clumps. Now, Forget about the units here. This is a uh, uh, density and it's a section. What I wanted to show you more interestingly are the circle points. Now, if another way to look at the gravitational collapse uh, is to look at the four profile of lines of the gravity like that. If you have a blue line profile like this, you can estimate the accretion rate on the flat of, of your class because this is due basically to the infall, to the global infall of your objects, right? Now, all the points that are cycled are the ones for which you can see a kind of infall profile like this. So you not only have an excess of kinetic energy as we could have uh, suggested from the previous plots, you also have that in all these objects, you clearly have a sign that some infall motions through to gravity at this point, because the infall must be driven by something, uh, let's say, symmetric to justify this kind of infall profile. And turbulence don't give you any kind of symmetric infall profile. All these guys here have an excess of kinetic energy we learned before, and that means a senior to gravitational collapse. So here is where we think that as we as you go above some surface density threshold, gravity must dominate the collapse. This has been also demonstrated somehow by Nicola Peretto this year, or well, last year now. Uh, so I don't want to go into the details of the analysis, but I think it's pretty nice just to look at the lapse on relation. Here are 27 clouds in which we basically measure this kind of period parameter mass radius relations from the external uh, sides of the cloud. So the green points, which are taken with the TCO into the inside part of the cloud when you go into H class. And the conclusion of the work is that you're basically a flat velocity dispersion radius relation. So you must have an increasing of velocity dispersion on your clamp scales inside. And then you start to have something that may resemble more or less a kind of Latson-like relation at the cloud scales. So in this interplay, you must have 
A candle two point dominated the collapse at the beginning, which becomes a gravity dominated collapse at the end of this process. So I summarized this in this paper in 2020. So basically, it's not clear the picture, but once you look at the single objects and you try to look at the cascade in the single objects, what we may have is really an interplay between turbulence and gravity. Simply that the one is dominated over the other when you reach some kind of surface density threshold. Now, this is important because the last relation tells you that the relation is true when you look at different sides. And then you think that at some sides you can break the last relation. Here is not anymore a matter of size, here is a matter of density, which means that you can get this, uh, this density even at 10 parts x scale in some filament. So, a 10 parts x scale filament may collapse due to gravity only, or a point one parts of filament, who knows? And then, when you put a lots of like relation, all the points in your galaxy, that's to answer, you may get different surface density kind of objects, which give you all the scatter and the completely crazy kind of correlation. But if you start to look at the density threshold, that's different. You can start to learn something more from Okay, this is to close the, let's say, the largest part of the, of the talk. So I think I still have five or 10 minutes, no? Okay, so I can quickly go to the second part, which is now to look from clumps to fragments. So what happens inside your clumps, inside your parsec scale objects in terms of collapse? And here also we have two kind of, let's say, models. One is a more turbulent dominated model, again, words in which you basically expect to form due to the pressure uh, into your clumps, one big massive standard object, so at least a very few number of fragments due to a kind of static collapse that will then form your final cluster. Then you have a way more dynamical approach in which you imagine that you can form, a, due to this gradient of global collapse, many seeds start here and there in your clumps, and then with time tends to accumulate throughout the central gravitation potential and form your eventually massive star. Now, one way to look at that was the work I've done with the Alma survey that's been published last year, uh, which basically was to look at the fragmentation properties and the depletion properties of clumps for which we had already information on the large scales, on the clamp scales, about the accretion uh, rate due to the blue profiling flow that I was mentioning you before. So the idea was, let's take all the clamps for which you have this kind of information. We know these are kind of globally collapsing. How this accretion will reflect into the clamp at the different evolutionary phases. So different L over M, as I was mentioned before, some from completely black at 70 micro to rather broad object up to X2 regions. Now the crucial rate is the order of 10 to the minus 3 for our masses per year at the class scales. What's happening inside to look at the fragmentation? Now this is how these guys look like if you go to look with Alma. So the solution now is from one parsec to five thousand U, so 0 0.02, 0 0.03 parsec or so. Now, you already see that the answer is not linear at all. You start with few or some fragments of very young stage, then you can move to have way more fragments, then you can move to have much less fragments. What is the evolution of this? That is not yet clear at all. In fact, then, of course, you can build, you have all your properties of your clumps from before. You can build all your properties of your cores here. Then I don't want to tell you, I mean, I don't want to go through all the correlations of cores, but just to give you a few ideas of what you can get. Now, you take the evolution of your clumps, for example. So the L over M, the number of fragments of cords that you find inside, you see that there is no correlation. Mm -hmm. The interesting part here is that from the very beginning, you already form many fragments. Many, at least few than one, more than one. So meaning that uh, you don't expect to form one simple blob of massive starless objects as it was uh, supposed to find the core fragment analysis. But you may form many seeds, and then they evolve in either accreting and probably merging, or then simply forming more, more cores inside. One way, which is uh, probably the last plot I'm going to show, uh, which I think is quite interesting. Again, there are a few points uh, because this is the first time we try to do that, but uh, it's been confirmed also from other results that I'll show you later. Now, the idea was okay, let's look at the distance between these seeds at the various time. Now, if the clump fed model is correct, and then you form many seeds here and there in your clumps, but then they converge towards your poten relational potential, you could expect basically that the distance between the fragments tends to decrease with the evolution because it tends to get closer and closer. And this is the distance between the clumps against the evolution taken by the clumps itself, the sorry, distance between fragments. And you can see that there is a kind of uh, a suggested trend, let's say which will suggest that indeed with time, these fragments tend to go to get closer 
each other, and so in a very kind of dynamical fashion way inside your cloud. So as I was mentioning to you, this is somehow also seen by other surveys. This is one way, one nice way to see at it. Those guys have combined two alma surveys, one called ashes, which are super young objects. So the red ones there with low L over M, and the atom survey, which are more evolved objects, higher L over M. And this is the distance, let's say the offset of your force with respect to the center of mass of your planet. For the more evolved, infrared bright, and the less evolved, infrared dark. You can see that you have a plethora of point far away from the center of mass of your planet, so the beginning of the evolution, that then tend to move into the center of your plant. So again, suggesting this, this kind of dynamical transfer model. Okay, there may be some other interesting relation. I don't want to go into the details. And just saying to you that there is a big elephant in the room that I'm not mentioning, and which is the magnetic fields. We don't yet really know how they work. We know that, uh, for example, you want to look at how you correlate with the self formation rate. You may say, yes, it has self formation rate. No, it doesn't have the self formation rate. So it's definitely yet an open question of how they really work at this scale so to, to have some place in it. And I will close uh, just to give you the picture of the model that we are imagining now for this uh, uh, fragmentation process in the multi scale view. And with this, I will conclude. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, well, of course, you and I already discussed this, but it probably is good for the audience also to, sure. to know it. Uh, of course, you know that perhaps where I am doubtful of, of this conclusion is at the level of the GMCs. Yes. And um, and there are reasons for believing that GMCs may be formed by gravity also. Uh, may, mainly, uh, Lee Hartman's paper with Javier from 2001 where where they concluded that gravity becomes important at scale. Uh, but, and as we were discussing, I think one common uh, issue with all of these, this kind of observations is that they only look at the effect of self-gravity. But, uh, but objects are not isolated. We isolate them artificially by selecting some selection criteria. But that doesn't mean that they are not part of a larger object that may be collapsing. So in, in this sense, uh, and I think that might be uh, an issue, for example, with the conclusion for the filaments and for the clumps mm -hmm. that look so messy. Uh, it might be uh, related to the fact that the, that the relevant gravity is not the gravity of the object that you have somehow artificially selected, but that of the parent object. And so, uh, in, in that sense, the, the idea of connecting to the parents, I, I think, is what, what's next and what should really give us the answer to, to, this, to this problem. And in particular, for example, for the GMCs, uh, I, I've seen some comments that the H1 envelopes might be very important in determining the total gravity, yes. for example. Mm -hmm. So to follow your comment, I, I agree that, um, of course, uh, you, the observations you select on Twitter, and then basically you define that as the region of observation. Yes. You cannot do better than that, of course. Mm -hmm. That says, I agree, as I showed you before, that the idea uh, is to connect similar regions to really look. But when you go to larger scales, then connecting the filaments that, below, that belong to that 3D structure at that point, for which mm -hmm. we may not have the 3D structure, uh, is a bit less straightforward in terms of observations. Yeah. And still, the open question that reminds to me in this sense, uh, is summarized, uh, sorry, here. So assuming that uh, connecting the dots is what uh, should be done to really look at the cascade, and expecting that the gravity should play the, the significant role at all scales, I wasn't expecting a change of slope here. Because then, if this way of thinking is correct, this should have been somehow independent from density. My guess from these results is that, you're right, clouds may collapse at large scales. Mm -hmm but only if they are dense enough to let the gravity win over your local turbulence. You may have a region which your turbulence is so slow that even a much few, let's say, a not too dense cloud is able to collapse. But it really depends on the environment in which you're looking for. I mean, even a super dense cloud, if it's nearby a supernova explosion, for whatever reason, may not collapse. So it's the density combined with the environment. It's these two components that probably defines and perhaps what we were also discussing, 
that you need the two variables, yeah, the density yes. and the size, for yes. example. So yes. a, at a given genes. density, a larger cloud is more yes. strongly balanced. But again, if you put them here by a supernova explosion, if you put them yeah. in a very quiet area, it will change the yeah, sure. And of course, we cannot know. Wait. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you. Can you um, comment a bit on the, uh, the, relative, the, the, the geometry of the different stages? Because it, it seems that the elongation increases going from giant molecular clouds to filaments, yes. but then the elongation, but then they become more spherical. Is, is that is that really happening and, and, and why? Okay, so let's say uh, clumps by definition are elliptical objects and over density that you can actually really see pretty well in maps like that. I mean, they're really kind of elliptical. Filaments are by definition elongated objects. Mm -hmm. So when you define a radius for a filament, uh, I mean, the axis ratio when it's too high, your radius is not really representative. So you may want to take like the larger uh, size, the, uh, let's say the, the largest uh, of the two axes of your filament, define what should be the velocity dispersion that should be representative of that size. But then the, the correlations change completely. The range, the, what we do and what people usually do, uh, let me go back sorry, to the first thing. Yeah, my question was more about why, mm -hmm. why things are more elongated at one particular scale. So that are more elongated, the filament scales for how we imagine the cloud tend to collapse. Since they are basically not spherically symmetric, mm -hmm. there are some perturbation that tends to accumulate more material along some particular spine direction. Now here you can have either turbulence, you know, you, you create in 3D, you create what they call sheets. So basically mm -hmm. the interaction from 2D surfaces that tend to create this kind of elongated filaments. Gravity as well can play. Can I comment on that? Sure. Uh, yeah. It, well, there is the famous case, well, famous to me, probably for nobody else. <laughs> uh, but it, uh, the case of this uh, core that was observed by Jaime Pineda and, and colleagues, uh, maybe around uh, 2009, 10. Yes. It was the archetype ah, yes. of a coherent core, and it was nice and round. Then they looked at it with the BLA, and it's full of filaments inside. You know? And so the, the full filament picture repeats itself inside the pores yes. when you look at, the, at them. What they're doing. So you're saying that it's partly an observational artifact that they seem to look more spherical at the core and clouds? Well, I would say so. I don't know. If you would. I, I would <laughs> say it's a combination in the sense that mm -hmm. you tend to form filamentary kind of structures from a kind of spherical initial condition. Within filaments, you tend to form spherically over density regions, which inside the form filamentary structures and spherically uh, kind of cones and so on and so forth. Because you get you get very dense filaments like in Orion, right? Yes, you see in yeah. Orion. But then you see cores along these filaments, yeah. which are roundish. So you keep forming these two structures so over and over one how many, each other. How many generations? Ah uh, well. Uh, <laughs> some point you have to form protocolary disks and then you create the similarity. Yeah, yeah. So the physics, uh, I mean, that's the discussion away because the physics seems to be the same, but the dominant mechanism may not be because for sure gravity at some point has to win by definition. Uh, I mean, it's from start by gravity. Uh, but at which scales or when, uh, that's definitely not clear. Please. Is it understood what fraction of the gas is in the turbulent uh, regime? And what fractures is it in the gravity dominated regime? Not really, not really. And that's part of the discussion that we are having in the community. Right? Because the point is uh, observation speaking, of course. Uh, you get a velocity dispersion, so you get a full width of your line. Now, how much of this is driven by gravity and much is driven by uh, turbulence that is not at all clear? You know that the non-thermal component in this kind of object doesn't count because the, the width from the non-thermal component is really insignificant in a way. But then it must be this correlation. And one way to see, at least to me, is to look at some orthogonal way of looking at that, like what I, I was mentioning, uh, sorry, quickly, here. So if uh, you have an, an, uh, an idea, like here, that the kinetic energy of your clamp, for example, seems to be over-dominating with respect to what you expect from kinetic energy from turbulence only, and also you see that these guys are falling, then you can imagine that the majority of that is driven by gravity. But how to quantify that, at least for me, is really not so obvious. I, I would say uh, that uh, if you look at CO, then most, in terms of number, most of clouds are over via, and only a few or, or less, less amount of clouds are, are, are via or sub -via. 
if you look at denser things, everything is so brilliant. Uh, sorry, so, so brilliant. brilliant. So, um, uh, in terms of mass, it's an issue because mm -hmm. the largest clouds have much more mass, and those are bound. Uh, those have alpha beer equal one. Or yes. Two, so, it's kind of tricky. Now, regarding this, this, this plot, so in here you are saying, or you are showing that the red points have, have statistically speaking, larger velocity expression than, than the blue ones. Yes. So high mass city, high, high column densities have larger velocity expression. Yes. Can you go to the other one? You mean this? The, the, the last one. From here, I would say is the other way around, isn't it? The filaments have larger velocity expression than uh, in, in, when yes. in the blue one case. Than the... Yes, okay, no, the filament here always have larger velocity expression than the clouds, probably because of the size of the region. But here are clouds only, those are only the clouds. So those are all one part six scale objects. Okay, well, <laughs> then they go back. And here, well, in terms of, in, in terms of clouds, I don't see such a Well, this is logarithmic. So if you, if you play, the other one is linear. So if you put them in linear, yes. Okay, then. This was logarithmic because of the dispersion of the filamentary velocity dispersion. Another question? Well, a, a variation of what has been said, and, and I have both a few times uh, Enrique and Vianney. And, <laughs> uh, uh, I think that, at, especially at the smaller scales, and probably also for the more evolved stages, the velocity dispersion at, at small scales should have other important components like, like feedback, yeah. rotation, ah, yes. outflows. So for example, I, I won't believe what, I, what I'm going to say because uh, I, I do believe in gravity to, to something. <laughs> but when I, uh, looking just barely at, this, uh, at these plots, uh, the left one is entirely constant with turbulent cascade. And yes. then the right one, you have excess, you have excess velocity dispersion at the smaller scales in the more evolved objects. So one could say, ah, it's because at, at the smaller scales there, there, is, there are bigger outflows Probably even like like a tiny yeah. region rotation of the of the of the clump, etc. Yeah. So so one could explain these plots only with turbulence and feedback. No problem. Yes, but no. these are not more evolved. These are only denser. Those ah, have okay. been chosen to be only ah. seventy micron dark exactly for this reason. Ah, sorry. So they are not seventy, right? Now, okay. That's another point because the seventy micron dark have a lot of outflows inside that we didn't expect them to have. But that's not the topic. Mm -hmm. So those are anyway the youngest objects that you can consider in terms of clouds, and they are all been chosen in this exact uh, way, exactly to avoid the feedback problem. So let's say if there is feedback, it's not dominating, or if it's dominating, then we really don't know where to look at the uh, alias phases because those are the alias phases points. So is there any like I know a statistical method or whatever to separate the velocity dispersion in components? Say okay, this is turbulence. We'll see but if this week uh, with Avier will uh, <laughs> we'll work out this. That's exactly one of the reasons. Because ah, okay. <laughs> at the moment, no. One, one very last comment. Uh, can you go to your second slide? Or second slide. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, Javier, if, you're, if it's going to be one last comment, I think we should allow somebody else. I think there was a hand. Uh, Ricardo, maybe? No, well, I didn't mean to be near. No, I only was to comment that, of course, separating different uh, kinematical uh, systems, not kinematical regions, you can maybe apply a Bayesian analysis on the spectrum. So people is doing that, then you can quantify how many components are really satisfactory in the Bayesian uh, evidence that you have. And it's up if you have enough uh, quality data, <laughs> enough yes. signal to noise, you can, you can. You can try to, okay, we can talk later about that. It's interesting. Okay, next one. <laughs> so you have something <laughs> with, with that equal one, something like that. Uh, another Ah, yes. She was nice, so, so Enrique is less yeah. beat, beaten up than yes. so, so it's <laughs> a, <laughs> I can change the color depending on the audience. <laughs> 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 so, no, the previous one, the previous one. so in the last row, you said that uh, alpha B equal one, then the cloud can slowly collapse. Uh, so let me just make a comment. If you have a bunch of stars and you start from superior conditions, that will collapse in a people time. And after that people time, it will reach alpha B equal one. 
Okay, so I will delete the slowly. Because you have the increasing of the viral parameter with time in your yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't say that it will slow the virus. I would agree if we would have seen the evolution of the viral parameter with time in the objects, which is not that clear if in observations we see. Yeah, but you are also not looking at evolution. Right? So you don't know really if it's slow or not. No, that I agree. But if you look at these guys here, for example, mm -hmm. they are also behavioral of basically all the evolutionary phases. They don't go to, I mean, the red points are the H2 regions, which actually, by the way, here, the feedback is important. So uh, it should be even, uh, so I, I tend to agree with the theory, but we don't see it in observation. So we need to figure out why. I have a, can I make a quick comment on sure. that? Uh, so uh, one thing, uh, if you could go back to your slide on the three cases for alpha, uh, I think it's, that could only be true if somehow magically alpha could be made to respond only to the turbulent components. But there's not so not such magic. So the, the non-thermal velocity dispersion includes everything. And, yes. and so you cannot separate it. Meaning that an object that has the alpha beer much uh, smaller than one does not necessarily mean it's uh, that it's from, in other words, you would expect it to have alpha of order two mm -hmm. if, if it's dominated by gravity, it's free falling. Uh, so a, a free falling object has alpha equals two, not alpha equals much, much if, smaller. Uh, if the alpha that we measure encompass the gravitational component of the bullets. If, if, yeah, but how can you separate the two? Velocity components. Well, it depends if, it, if it's not a, a symmetric collapse, it's something like that, for example. And I'm looking here. Mm, okay, maybe so. In, in that, but you would have to design observations, perhaps specifically, in order to somehow filter out the bulk quotients and just be left with the small, <laughs> supposed uh, hypothetical small. Probably structure. the geometry. Okay. I tend to agree with you, it's just to discuss, but I think probably the geometry is what gives the scatter. Yeah. Okay. So we see for the students we have the after in Tapanado. So see you in the uh, questions. Perfect. Perfect.